As many of you know, the ministries of, one of the ministries of the Western Pennsylvania District is the Hogar Emanuel Children's Home in Honduras. And since 1972, hundreds of children who are homeless from the age of infancy to 18 years of age are able to live in a loving Christian family type atmosphere. For the home to continue to offer this care, they depend on our prayers and our donations. Recently, they have suffered some setbacks with the passing of their office administrator from COVID, flooding from the last hurricane, and needing to replace a refrigerator and freezer that were just worn out. We felt that maybe we could help a little bit with the Blue Bear Project. You probably remember seeing these around the church before. We are placing these little blue bears around the church, and if you have some loose change, please drop it in, and it'll help the children at Hogar Emanuel Children's Home. One thing about down where these children are at, they do raise their own vegetables. I believe they do chickens and are able to sell their eggs. So they do some things to help support themselves, which is really great in this day and age that they have a, you know, some source of income and some things that they can learn as a help with a trade. Good morning. Let us pray. Lord, we sing a new song to you. We sing to the Lord. We sing to all the earth. We praise your name. We praise your salvation. We declare your glory. We worship you in the splendor of holiness. And among all the nation, you reign. Amen. This morning... The, uh, my sermon title is The Name of God, and it's John 1, 1 through 5. And I want to read that first. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. And what has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. So I want to welcome all of you here this morning. I hope you're all comfortable. I know it's uncomfortable outside. So, with this being the name of God, how many nicknames do you have? I have several. I have Sherry, Sis, Schmoopy, and probably a couple more. Yes. <laughs> yes, Grandma? <laughs> no, uh, actually, it's Nanny. Okay. Okay. Nanny. And then Jack, my husband, his real name is John. Okay. However, he's Jack, Jackie Boy, um, Jackson, and I, I know it, it isn't, but I call him Lekvar because his cousin calls him something, and that's what it sounds like to me. So, and I think Lekvar is a type of a uh, pierogi. I think it's the prune one. <laughs> so, then we're going to talk about Indiana Jones, the last crusade. He is forced to go find the Holy Grail to save his dad, Sean Connery, but he must pass three tests. The breath of God, because only a penitent man will pass, and he must humble himself before God, kneel before God, and... And as he does this, a saw whizzes across the top of his head as he falls on his knees. The word of God. Only in the footsteps will he proceed. The name of God. But it starts with an I in Latin as he almost falls into an abyss because he steps on J for Jehovah. Only a leap from the lion's head can a man feel his worth. A leap of faith. Indiana, he must believe as he steps out on what looks like he is stepping on out into a great crevice, but there is a stone ledge he walks across and gets to the space where the last crusader is waiting his replacement. When all this is over, he is asked why, if his name is Henry Jones Jr., where does Indiana come from? Indiana was the dog. 
Indiana Jones was willing to risk his life for, to save his father's life. Are we willing to risk our lives for others in the search for truth and God? So let us look at some of these names of God. There are 31 names of God. We are not going to look at 31 names today. Um, we are going to look at Emmanuel, God with us. The name of a child whose birth symbolizes the presence of God. Isaiah uses this term, and Matthew quotes it as its fulfillment of the Old Testament. God came down and walked among us. He walked and lived as a man. He was a child. He had parents. He laughed. He cried. We know his parents got mad at him when he was at the temple, when they were going home, and they couldn't find him, and they had to turn around and go back and get him. Who's ever had to turn around and go back and find their child? When I was in Florida last September, uh, uh, the ladies who home, he was my brother's friend, um, she said that one time when my, my, ne my nephew and her son, they were the same age when they were younger, she told her boys to stay in the car. She had to go pick something up at Boy Scout camp, and they were going to, he had a karate lesson, so don't get out of the car. So she goes and picks up whatever she needs from her husband and heads back down the road. So she's talking and then realizing her son wasn't in the back seat. She had to turn around and go get him. She was not pleased. So imagine Mary and Joseph having to go back and find Jesus. I'm sure they had the same emotions that we would have. Like, what are you doing here? And we know his response. Didn't you know I would be here? He said that. Don't you know where to find me? He worked. We know he was a carpenter before he went out into the mission field. He taught. He was crucified. He died. And he was raised on the third day. God is with us. Jehovah Rapha. The Lord who heals. How many times in the Bible do we see God's healing power? As in the book of Job, the patient must trust that God's undisclosed reasons are just. Because we know in Job, not only did he lose his family, he then became covered in sores. And his friends all said, well, what did you do to make God mad? But we know at the beginning of Job that we know it wasn't Job's fault. The devil had said, well, what can I do? And he says, well, there's my servant Job. You can do anything, but you can't touch him. So Job lost everything. He lost his children. He lost, they lost their homes. He lost his animals. It, it was just a mess. And what does his wife say to him during all this time? Well, why don't you just curse God and die? Well, to me, I always think it's funny because Job turned around and had more children. So who do you think had them, Mrs. Job? <laughs> I always think of that as the revenge. You may not see it that way, but that's how I see it. She had to raise toddlers again and teenagers. <laughs> In Isaiah 53, 5, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us to peace was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. His wounds. Healing is not just our body, but also the other hurts we endure. The ones we bring on ourselves from lying and knowingly, or, not by, or by hurting others. We make ourselves sick by the harm we may have caused others. How do we make it right? We go to the one who knows all and can heal all. We know this. How many times have we hurt someone? And in return, sometimes that hurt backfires and it comes back on us. There, there's, a, there's an old kid saying, you know, it bounces off me and sticks on you. So, you know, sometimes things turn around and, and we have to wonder why did we do that in the first place? What caused us to be so nasty? But we are told that Jesus can heal us. 
whether our wounds are physical, whether they're mental, whether we caused them or someone else caused us to be harmed. He is there for us. These are different names of God. But why do I say that? Because Jesus came down and Jesus was here as God. God walked among us. He was there. Elroy, the God who sees me. This one really hits the mark also. 1 Samuel 16, 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not see as a man does, for man sees the outward appearance of the outward appearance, but the Lord sees the heart. Verse 11, and Samuel said to Jesse, are all sons here? And he said, there remains the youngest, but behold, he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and fetch him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. What is this passage getting to? Well, Samuel but asked Jesse to present his sons. When pressed, Jesse informed Samuel, his youngest son David, was keeping the sheep. Why? He just thought, well, he's the youngest. What's the youngest kid going to do? He knows nothing. Because after all, well, we do know. If you want to know anything, go ask a teenager because they know everything, right? But because he was the youngest and the way things were back then, usually prestige went to the oldest son and then went down from there. You didn't go to start at the youngest. They're like, why? Because we know with the prodigal son, he knew he wasn't going to get very much of anything because he was the younger son. So he went to his father and asked for his portion. Same thing here. Why would... Why would David expect anything. He was the youngest. Till his, they went through his brothers. You know, he was probably going to, you know, be lucky if he got anything except the sheep in the field. But we know from there, David was anointed to be king. Jesse didn't see what God saw in David. He saw potential. How many times are we overlooked because people don't see our potential? It happens all the time. There are people that they have great things that they can do, but they are overlooked because, eh, you know, they're just so-and-so. They just, they just kind of fade in the background. But then, maybe they're, whatever they do as their hobby or as their something on the side that people don't see, they don't, all of a sudden, they move forward. And, and people don't see that potential. And then when you talk to them, and they'll say, oh, I never knew you could. Well, you didn't ask, number one. It, just an example. I'll tell you, when I was going through school, you know, I went to all my classes, went through everything um, for being a, a minister, my, my minister classes. And, you know, it took time. But when I started, I was on the gifts discernment team here in the district. Okay? I have been on the camp board. And then I was on pastor and parish, and now I'm the district moderator. Somebody saw potential along the way. Same thing in our lives. People that sit on the board, and they belong to other organizations, and where they fit into the society and the community, that's where God uses our potential. Jehovah, Jerah, the Lord will provide. The name given by Abraham to the place where God provided the ram to be offered in place of Isaac. We know in Genesis, from the beginning, God provided time and time again. Adam was lonely, and God provided Eve. In Genesis 22, Abraham was to sacrifice Isaac, and because he obeyed, a ram was provided for the sacrifice. Moses and the Israelites, from the time before they left Egypt, God took care of them because he protected Moses, and he had kept himself safe until it was time for him to lead the Israelites. We are told up front in this scripture that the word was with God, and the word was God. God is, was, and always will be. There is no beginning 
and there is no ending. Here's the challenge. Many people in culture today are learning how to live very comfortably without God. Isn't that terrible? It concerns me. <laughs> Jesus came from the Father and returned to him. So how do we face this challenge? Do you live without God in your life? The name of God, which the Jewish people do not speak. So holy is his name. Moses had to remove his sandals to stand on the ground for, of the burning bush when God told him to come, but take your sandals off first. God is so holy, even from the beginning, when he get, told Adam and Eve, all of this is yours, but do not eat from the tree. There is a rhyme and a reason to everything God does. We have to listen. We have to respect him. He is the reason that we are, that we have, and that we have to have faith that we will return there. I had gone to a synagogue a, a few times with a class I was taking, and when you read the Jewish Bible, you read it from the back to the front, and, and you, it's, it's very different, let me tell you. And, but um, there are some different names in there that, uh, for God also, and it depends on in what context which name you use. And, and, and it was just so moving because, you know, we say God, Lord, Father, but theirs have such more, a, a different specific meaning. The God who sees me, the God will provide, the Lord who heals, God who is with us. He doesn't leave us alone. Jesus told me that. I will not leave you alone. I am going to send one here for you that will comfort you. Which is so exciting. I am never alone. I don't have to be afraid. I love that. It's what's gotten me through. Not, you don't think about it so much as a, as a child so much, but as you grow older and the different difficulties that come up through your life, whether, whether you're just going to school and you just don't know how you're going to study for that test and get it all done, um, just different if there's um, t time constraints at work and you have to have a project finished in, in a very unreasonable time. These are things that we have to pray. You have to pray before you start your projects because it makes a difference. I prayed before I wrote a letter this week and everything in that letter was addressed and I never had to send it. Everything. And you don't know how much anxiety I could let go. I didn't have to confront this person with my, with my concerns, with my issues, and how things are going to move forward in a Christian, Christ-like setting. God alone has the power to raise the dead and grant eternal life. God is present and active in the world. We see it every day. We do see miracles. According to Psalm 104, 1 through 3, God has made the time and space of this world for God's own dwelling place. Sin may lead to disloyalty and misunderstanding, and we see that in the world every day. God's powerful world may be resisted, questioned, rejected, scorned, and despised. Sounds like Jesus. He was all those things. He was rejected and scorned by men. He was sent down from God to this earth to save us from ourselves. We are our own worst enemies, and we don't have to be. The name of God we take for granted. Some don't understand the true awesomeness of who he is. I was once told that we use the word awesome way too much, and we don't, and we take that word for granted. Awesome. The Grand Canyon, the ocean, the sky. Awesomeness. The creator of what is, everything that was or ever will be. Going back to the beginning, God created. Do we question the very first sentence of who God is? I think not. We don't question who God is. All 
The descriptive names tell us he is a God who knows us on so many levels. I have to believe this. I cannot move forward in my life as it is. I know that Jesus will take me to the Father. I ha pray that. I study. I have to believe that. Or we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't spend week after week here. We wouldn't go to the board meetings. We wouldn't go to Sunday school. Why would we study scripture? Why? Why? All of this tells us that he is a God who knows us on so many levels. He knows us when we wake up and when we go to bed. He is there. He is with me. He knows me. He heals me. And he will provide for me. How do I know this? The Bible tells me so. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Go now. Go in safety, for you cannot go where God is not. Go in love, for love alone endures. Go with purpose, and God will honor your dedication. Go in peace, for it is the gift of God to those whose hearts and minds are in Christ Jesus. Amen.